Please turn your Bibles with me to 1 Samuel 14. 1 Samuel 14, we return to our overview of 1 and 2 Samuel in our series, The, the Covenant King. And as you turn, there are, there are a couple things I just want to say, kind of remind us of some things as a family. Uh, first of all, as we've already mentioned a few times this morning, I want to make sure you join us after church for our celebration of uh, Kent and Janelle as we have a... Uh, reception for them after church. And then also be sure to come out next Sunday evening for our our family meeting. There's a lot going on next week at that family meeting. We're going to be affirming, uh, Lord willing, new officers and affirming a budget. And as we affirm the budget, there's a lot in that budget. (laughs) There's kind of three new things in there that we need to, to make sure that we're all aware of. One, as we approve that budget, we're going to be approving funds for the, the church replant. And so we'll talk more about that next Sunday evening, but that's going to be part of that budget. And then also in the budget is a, uh, our two staff positions. One is that internship that we uh, just uh, talked about with, with Jake. And then the other is a church, uh, a pastor who's going to be overseeing the church replant. And so those positions are in that budget that we'll be approving. And then also that Sunday evening, Lord willing, We'll be affirming two people for those positions. So uh, Jake, and, and he'll be a, that uh, youth and family discipleship intern, and then uh, Jordan will be uh, being considered for the pastor who'll be overseeing the the church plant. So that's all next Sunday evening. And also that next Sunday evening, we're going to be holding a reception for Kevin and Sarah Martin as uh, Kevin retires from being an elder here at Bethany as well. And we'll uh, be celebrating him and just thanking them for their ministry over the last 32 years of shepherding Christ's church. Uh, There's, boy, there's a lot of things to say. Um, What to cover this morning? We'll cover some things next week, I think, too. But uh, one thing you do need to know about, there's an opportunity. We we, uh, want to give you a resource. Every year we try to give a a book as a resource to the church. And this, this morning, if you're in Blake's Sunday School class... Uh, my dear friend Jonathan shared, and one of the things that he was talking about was the need for a church to, to help its people have good doctrine and, and to be aware of bad ideologies. And there's, there's two books that you can choose from, so you have to make a choice. Uh, but it's a good choice, right? And there's two books, we'll talk more about these next week, but one is called Strange New World, How Thinkers and Activists Redefined Identity and sparked the sexual revolution. That's by Carl Truman. And this is a little bit more of a philosophical work, but if you really want to understand how did we get where we are today in terms of how our culture thinks and what's a biblical way to think, this is a really, really helpful book. I, I've mentioned before the book um, that, that's the larger book that this is, this is based on, um, uh, Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. That's a Big, thick book. This is a little bit of a thinner book, and it's still got a lot of great stuff in there and, and would recommend it to you. The other is a, a little bit more of a, a biblical, kind of a biblical study. What does the Bible really teach about homosexuality? And so you can use that QR code or go to the church email this week or church center, and you can uh, reserve one of those books uh, per family, and we'd love to give that to you as a resource uh, for you and in, in your, uh, your edification. Also, uh, want to there's some things I want to encourage new people with. Uh, be sure to check out our website. There's a newcomer lunch and some membership class. There's Be Real this Tuesday for women who are new to the church. Great opportunity to get to know other women in the church. And you know, I'm just going to punt a lot of these things till next week. We'll, we'll say some more about some of these things next week. But uh, want to make you aware of those things. They're a little bit more pressing as as a family. Well, uh, we are now. I'm going to turn our attention more fully to 1 Samuel chapter 14. We're in a three-week series. The overall series is the covenant king, and we're looking at the Christ of the the new covenant and how the old covenant kings point to Jesus Christ, and the Davidic king points to the new covenant king of Jesus Christ. And we're going to be talking about that more as we go through 1 and 2 Samuel. But these three weeks, we are dealing with a, a series called The Heart God Rejects. And so here, we see Saul having a heart that doesn't love God. And as the condition of his heart is revealed, we see God rejecting Saul as king. And these chapters reveal that Saul's obedience to God is conditional. 
that it's not true obedience. And Saul always has a reason why he doesn't have to obey God. So in chapter 13, uh, Saul believes, look, you don't have to obey God when it seems unwise to you. Here in chapter 14, we're going to see Saul believe that you don't have to obey God if, if your circumstances don't warrant obedience. And then as we come to chapter 15 next week, Lord willing, we'll see that Saul believes you don't have to obey God if you don't understand what God is saying. Or if you think you're obeying God, that's, o- that's okay as well. And we'll see what this is revealing is that Saul doesn't truly love God because, as we're the kind of main idea of this series, is that a heart that loves God obeys God. And Saul doesn't have a heart that loves God. So let's, let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 14. I encourage you, as I've mentioned before, we're doing an overview of First and Second Samuel, as we often do with larger sections in the Old Testament. So I encourage you to be reading this on your own, because we're not going to have time on a Sunday morning to go through every verse of an overview. But, uh, so be reading chapter 15 for next week. But let me just read some of the verses from chapter 14 this morning. And if you're able to, if you'd stand with me in honor of God as we read his word together. First Samuel chapter 14. I'll begin in verse 1. And remember the, the situation. The Philistines and the Israelites are at a, an impasse. There's, there is a, a stalemate taking place, and they are, the, their forces are just several miles from one another. And we come to verse 1 of chapter 14, and we read this. One day, Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man who carried his armor, Come, let us go over to the Philistine garrison on the other side. But he did not tell his father. Saul was staying in the outskirts of Gibeah in the pomegranate cave at Migron. The people who were with him were about 600 men, including Ahijah, the son of Ahitub, Ichabod's brother, son of Phinehas, son of Eli, the priest of the Lord, and Shiloh, wearing an ephod. And the people did not know that Jonathan had gone. Within the passes by which Jonathan sought to go over to the Philistine garrison, there was a rocky crag on one side and a rocky crag on the other in the name of one was Boses, and the name of the other, Sinna. The one crag rose on the north in front of Michmash, and the other on the south in front of Geba. Jonathan said to the young man who carried his armor, Come, let us go over to the garrison of, those, of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. And his armor bearer said to him, Do all that is in your heart, do as you wish. Behold, I am with you, heart and soul." And then Jonathan said, Behold, we will cross over to the men, and we will show ourselves to them. If they say to us, Wait until we come to you, then we will stand still in our place, and we will not go up to them. But if they say, Come up to us, then we will go up, for the Lord has given them into our hand, and this shall be the sign to us. So both of them showed themselves to the garrison of the Philistines. And the Philistines said, Look, Hebrews are coming out of the holes where they've hidden themselves. And the men of the garrison hailed Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, Come up to us, and we'll show you something. And Jonathan said to his armor bearer, Come up after me, for the Lord has given them into the hand of Israel. Then Jonathan climbed up, his hands and feet, and his armor bearer after him, and they fell before Jonathan, and his armor bearer killed them after him. After that first strike, which Jonathan and his armor bearer made, killed about, and that first strike, which Jonathan and his armor bearer made, killed about 20 men within, as it were, half a furrow's length and an acre of land. And there was a panic in the camp and the field and among all the people, the garrison and even the raiders trembled. The earth quaked. It became a very great panic. Come down to verse 23. It says, The Lord saved Israel that day, and the battle passed beyond beth And the men of Israel had been hard-pressed that day, so Saul laid, on a, laid an oath on the people, saying, Cursed be the man who eats food until it is evening, and I am avenged on my enemies. So none of the people had tasted food. You may be seated. May God be glorified and our hearts cur- encouraged and strengthened by God's eternal word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are mindful today of our great need for you. We love you, and we desire to walk in obedience to you, and yet we are, we are unable to do so. So we, we thank you for your son Jesus, for his perfect work, his perfect obedience to you, to your law, his death, taking our place 
on the cross, bearing the, the punishment for our sin and being resurrected to, to live, and that we can, can have life in Him as we die to self and live in Him through the, the power of Your grace. We, we praise You for that. And we would ask that through the work of Your Spirit this morning, we would understand the truth of Your Word, and we would live it out by Your grace for Your glory and for our joy. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. In the 1920s, there was a humorist named uh, P.G. Wodehouse who wrote a short story about a golfer. And the short story was entitled, The Heart of a Goof. The Heart of a Goof. And in the story, Wodehouse explains that a goof is a person who is, is paralyzed from making a decision. They, they, they can't act, and so they, they, they just wait, and they're, they're paralyzed, and they can't really do anything. Wodehouse writes this about the, the goof of a golfer. He says, a goof golfer is one of those unfortunate beings who have allowed this noblest of sports to get too great a grip upon them and have permitted to eat in their souls like some malignant growth. And then Wodehouse tells the short story of a, a golfer who is a goof named Ferdinand Dibble. And Ferdinand Dibble overthinks everything. He overthinks his golf game, and as he overthinks his golf game, it, it paralyzes not just his golf game, but, but all of his life, including his love life, and much to the frustration of this, this young woman who loves him named Barbara. Wodehouse writes about how Dibble is paralyzed. He says, uh, Ferdinand Dibble had always made the game of golf hard for himself by thinking too much. He was a, a deep student of the works of all the great golf masters, and whenever he prepared to play a stroke, he had a complete mental list of all the mistakes which it was possible to make. And so Woodhouse describes how, how Dibble will stand and get ready to, to hit a ball, and as he's getting ready to hit the ball, he'll remember all the things that his golf instructors have told him not to do. You know, don't don't lift your head up, don't bend your shoulder, don't over-tighten your muscles. And as he'll think about all those things, he just stands there looking at the ball, afraid to swing the club. And Woodhouse in the story talks about how finally Dibble is able to act and, and not think about everything and actually play the game of golf, and his golf game improves and so does his love life, which just goes to show you something, but I don't know what. Uh, let me say this uh, with great pastoral love. Some of us are Christian goofs, right? We are paralyzed in, in inactivity, <laughs> unable to move, unable to, to act in our Christian life, and this is a huge problem because the Christian life is, is one of obedience, not passivity, not in action. We don't want to act with presumption, arrogantly assuming we know what to do and just start doing things. And yet at the same time, we recognize that, that God has not called us to be passive, waiting for life to come to us. One of the ways that disobedience in the Christian life sometimes manifests itself is in inactivity, in inaction. We look at difficult circumstances and as we're overwhelmed with, with difficult circumstances or, or the hardness of life, we just kind of retreat into ourselves and we, we don't do what God has called us to do. And we believe that our circumstances that are difficult excuse us from obedience. But in action, passivity is not obedience. And a heart that loves God desires to walk in obedience, right? Here's the main idea that I want us to look at as we look at 1 Samuel chapter 14 and see another characteristic of Saul's heart. Again, the main idea of the series is a heart that loves God, desires to obey God, but more specifically, what I want us to see this morning is neither passivity nor presumption fulfill God's purpose for his people. Let me say that again, neither passivity kind of this, this passive inaction, nor presumption, just this arrogant action without consulting the Lord and his desires, neither one of those fulfill God's purpose for his people. God calls his people to biblical obedience, to biblical faithful action. Saul 
swings from passivity to presumption, and neither one of those ditches are the road of obedience. So we're going to look at that. We're going to see passivity is not obedience, and we're going to see presumption is not obedience. Let's begin by looking at passivity, and we see that passivity is not obedience in verses 1 through 23. Look at that text with me, if you would, and remember where we are in the story. The Philistines have gathered at Michmash. They are in the hill country of Israel, and they are causing lots of problems. They've encamped at Michmash, and they're sending these these raids into the, the territory, and Saul and his forces are gathered just a few miles away, and Jonathan is near his father's forces as well, maybe a mile away from that. There's a ravine in between where the Israelites are and where the Philistines are, and there's a stalemate. And as, as Saul kind of, kind of sits around wondering what to do, Jonathan decides to act. It says, look here at the, the setting here, Jonathan says to the young man who's carrying his armor, hey, let's, let's, let's go to the Philistine garrison on the other side. So let's, let's cross this, this valley, this ravine, and, and let's, let's go to the Philistine garrison that's just a short distance away from Michmash where the main Philistine forces are gathered. And he doesn't say much else to the armor bearer. And he also, the text tells us, doesn't say anything to his dad. Perhaps Jonathan is following that, that, that age-old counsel of it's better to ask forgiveness than permission. Maybe he knows his, his father will discourage it, but for whatever reason, he, he doesn't tell him. Now, that brings us to verse 2, and, and we, as we set the setting here, we see what his father is doing. It says that his father is in the outskirts of Gibeah in the pomegranate cave, and I think you see the footnote in some of your translations. Maybe a better way to understand the translation there is it's underneath a pomegranate tree at Migron, and he's, he's not really doing anything. Maybe he's conducting some, some government business there, but he's not acting. He kind of moves his forces a mile here, a mile there, but hasn't really done anything. Who else is with him? Verse 3 tells us Ahijah is with him. That's the grandson of Phineas. I'm sorry, the grandson of Eli, Phineas's older son. And so, remember, Eli was told that his sons were discredited from continuing the office of priest, and so you have this, this uh, rejected priestly line. Saul has been rejected as king in the last chapter. It's a bleak, it's a bleak setting. In fact, look at verse 4. If you said, boy, this isn't bleak enough, it says, Jonathan sought to go over these passes, and there's this, these two crags. The name of the one was Boses, and the name of the other was Sinner. You translate those. One was named Slippery, and the other was named Thorny. Not good, right? One commentator says this, so much for the setting. Our writer has been rather brisk. Here's the plan, which is secret. Here are the leaders who are rejected. Here is the place, which is impossible. But how does Jonathan respond? Now, in this chapter, Jonathan and Saul are contrasted with one another for the purpose of showing why God rejects Saul as king. How does Jonathan re- respond to the, this circumstance? He's, he's, unlike his father, he's not dismayed. What, is, what does Jonathan know? As Jonathan looks at this situation, I believe God has revealed to Jonathan, and Jonathan believes what God has said earlier, for example, in 1 Samuel chapter 12, where God told the people at, through Samuel that it will go well if you walk in obedience. And, and, and Jonathan believes what God has said through Samuel. So Jonathan's heart is not like his father's heart. He says, to again, to the young man who's carrying his armor, verses 6 and following, he says, hey, let's go over to the garrison of, of these uncircumcised, of the Philistines. And then it's, he says this, it may be it, it, it may be, this, this may be what God does. He's not presumptuous. It, it may be that, that Yahweh, that the Lord, will work for us because God can do whatever he wants. He can sa- he's going to save, and he can save by a lot of us or by few. Let's see what God does. That's Jonathan's heart. He's not arrogantly demanding that the Lord save through him, but he believes that God will save, and he begins to act in obedience to that, in faith. In verse 7, the armor bearer responds, and he recognizes that Jonathan's words reveal his heart. He says, look, I'm, literally, he says, I'm, I'm with you according to your heart. And so Jonathan comes up with, with a plan. Okay, here's what we're going to do. 
We're going to go show ourselves to them. We're going to go uh, through the ravine, and they're going to see us. He says, if, if they say to us, wait until we come to you, then we'll stand in our place. We won't go to them. That would have indicated that perhaps what he's thinking is that would indicate that they're prepared, that they're ready, and, and they don't want to, 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 uh, to, to go to them in that situation. But if they say, come up to us, that's going to reveal something about their arrogance and their lack of preparedness, and then we'll do it. That'll be a sign to us. So again, he's not presuming what the Lord is going to do, but he knows that God's going to save. And he says, look, this, this might be how God chooses to save his people. Let's see what God does. Let's start acting. And that's what happens. What I want you to notice here in verses 8 through 13 is notice what happens when a heart that loves God collides with difficult circumstances. A heart that loves God, when, when it encounters difficult circumstances, just doesn't sit back and say, oh, okay, well, I, I need to wait for my circumstances to change before I can walk in obedience to God. A, a heart that loves God, as it, as it kind of collides with these difficult circumstances, begins to walk in obedience with humility, recognizing that, that God is going to do what God is going to do. It, it trusts in God. And that's, that's what happens here in these verses. And they, they climb up, verse 13, he climbs up on his hands and his feet. They, they go into this, this perhaps undetected area of the, of the crag there, and his armor bearer goes after him. And then in this, this space of about half an acre, they, they strike. Jonathan and his armor bearer says he killed after him, so maybe they're standing back to back, and 20 men die in that short area of, of space. And then there's this panic in the camp, and it says uh, the, the raiders trembled, the earthquake, and there was a very great panic. God begins to save his people through Jonathan's initiative, his faithful obedience. And then as you go into verse 16, where's Saul? Well, he's, he's watching. The watchmen of Saul are, are watching. They see what's happening. And Saul says, who's missing? They find out it's Jonathan and his armor bearer. And Saul says, okay, let's, let's bring the ark of God here. And then he asks the, the, the priest to consult the uh, Urim and Thummim to see what, what's taking place. But, but before he can even do that, events overtake them and they're engaged in the battle. And I want you to notice now, it wasn't bad, of course, for Saul to ask for God's direction, but that should have happened a long time ago, right? This was not the time. It should have happened long before this. Now, there's one more thing I want you to notice before we talk about some application here. I want you to notice in verse 20 and following, notice how Jonathan's obedience affects other people. It says, Saul and all the people who were with him rallied and went into the battle. And then verse 21, now the Hebrews who had been with the Philistines before that time, who had gone up with them into the camp, even they also turned out to be with the Israelites who were with Saul and Jonathan. And then there was a third group of people. Likewise, when all the men of the Israel who had hidden themselves in the hill country of Ephraim heard that the Philistines were fleeing, they too followed hard after them in battle. So you have these three groups of people. You have the people who are in the army. As they see what God is doing through Jonathan, and they see the tumult in the Philistine camp, they're encouraged and they, they rally to the battle. You you have the people who had been in the Philistine camp, and perhaps they were traitors, perhaps they were indentured servants of some type. They see what's happening, and their hearts are encouraged, and they join in the fight. And then you have a third group of people who have been hiding in caves or something, and they see what's happening, and, and they get engaged in the battle for the Lord as well. Jonathan's obedience has this, this rippling effect into the hearts of other people. Now, here's the principle, right? Passivity is not obedience. Saul isn't the one who acts. It's, it's Jonathan. And our hearts are often revealed, and we'll talk more about this in a minute. Our, our hearts are often revealed by crisis, by, by our circumstances. A, a crisis takes place, and it begins to, to squeeze our hearts. And, and what's then that and the crisis is our hearts are squeezed What's, what's inside the heart is revealed. Now, when I say that passivity is, 
is not obedience. I'm, I'm not arguing for impatience, right? <laughs> I'm not saying you just need to act with impatience and, and presumption. We'll talk about that in a moment, but that's not what I'm arguing for. Oftentimes, patience in, in individual circumstances is exactly what God would call us to do as we walk in faith. But what, what I am saying is this. When a crisis and your heart collide, does your trust in God manifest itself through walking in faithful obedience? Or do you believe that your circumstances allow you to be passive? Are you going to wait for circumstances to change before you act? If you're a person who is inclined towards passivity, toward, towards inaction, let, let me just give you four encouragements here as we think about applying the text here. So four, four encouragements for you as you think about obedience to God, being like Jonathan, beginning, beginning to act. Number one, number one, look first to biblical truth and not your circumstances. As you go through life, number one, be saturated in Scripture, not circumstances. And so as we, we think about what are some biblical truths that need to be constantly on the forefront of our mind, that our, our souls need to be, be constantly marinating in, uh, one of the, the truths we need to be constantly thinking about is that God is sovereign and good, right? Think about we just went through the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 4, it talks about how the, uh, Peter and John are released from prison. They go to their friends and they reported what the chief priests and elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted up their voices together to, to God. And what comes out is, as they've been squeezed, what comes out of their, their heart? They say, Sovereign Lord. They didn't say, God, how could you let this happen? You say, Sovereign Lord. What just happened to us is exactly what you de- decreed would happen to us. Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Passivity is not obedience. One of the, one of the truths that, that we need to think about first is we think about acting. We need to look first to biblical truths, and one of the truths we need to look to is that that God is sovereign and good. Another truth that our souls need to just marinate in is that that we're to proclaim the gospel of God in in harsh environments. That's a a truth. As as I look at my circumstances, I need to remember, God's sovereign and good, and I'm called to proclaim the gospel in good and bad circumstances. So I, I find myself in a hard circumstance. That's not something surprising to God, and it shouldn't be something surprising to me. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, we read in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, right? Another truth we, we just kind of meditate on is that God's going to save us. We don't know how that looks in the short term. We're not quite sure how it looks in the medium term. But we know God's going to save. God saves his people. Psalm 41, by this I know that you delight in me. My my enemy will not shout in triumph over me, but you have upheld me because of my integrity and set me in your presence forever. We know that by God's grace, we are going to be in the presence of God forever. Not quite sure how that's going to work out in the short term, but as I I face circumstances, what do I do? I, I look at my circumstances after I first look to biblical truths. And so I look at the biblical truths and say, look, God is sovereign. God is good. God is going to save. God has called me to proclaim the gospel. And so I first look at biblical truth. The second thing I do, though, is then I I look at circumstances through the eyes of faith, right? I'm in a difficult situation. And and I ask the question, why why is God doing this? I, I, I think about those biblical truths, and I look at my circumstance, and I ask the question, why is God doing this? Why is there that garrison, garrison of the Philistines? 
there. Why might God be doing this? Maybe it's to fit me for heaven. Maybe there's just a lot more work that needs to go on in my life before I am prepared to spend eternity with Christ. Okay. Let's, let's do some breaking. Or maybe, uh, maybe it's to minister to others. You know, maybe there, there are some people in your life who are semi-engaged in the Christian life. Maybe they're like the, they're like the Israelites in the camp of Saul. They're there. They want to fight. But they haven't really engaged the Christian life. And, and God is bringing hard circumstances into your life to, to, to motivate them. Or, or maybe there are some who have, le- who have, who have begun to, to leave the faith. They are in the camp of the Philistines. And they're serving the Philistines. They're serving the world. And as God brings hard circumstances into your life, God is bringing those hard circumstances and difficulties into your life to, to show them what it looks like for a person to truly engage in obedience in the Christian life. Or or maybe there are some some people are just, they're hiding. They're in the caves. They're in the workplace, and they are just hoping that no one asks them any hard questions about what they believe. And God, in his kindness, is bringing you into a hard situation uh, so that, by God's grace, you will motivate them to care for others as well. So, we look first to biblical truths, this is my our application here, look first to biblical truths, then we look at our circumstances through the eyes of faith, and then we begin to act. You gotta act. You gotta do something. By faith, motivated by a desire to love and obey God, but Don't passively sit on the sidelines. Don't be lulled to complacency in kingdom work by your to-do lists and your meetings and your love of ease and your entertainment idols. God has called you to do stuff. Gird up your loins and get to work. If your circumstances, either good circumstances or bad circumstances, have brought you to a place of immobility, you are not demonstrating a love for God. Again, not talking about the need to wait patiently at times. That That's an action, oftentimes. But I'm talking about passivity. Do some bold things, guys. Do some bold things for the Lord. Act in faith. There's a garrison. Grab an armor bearer and and just see what God does. Not with presumption. But say, God, I, I know I'm supposed to do some stuff here. I'm going to begin to act in obedience, and if you're in this, let it be successful. Maybe you've just been sitting on the sidelines, kind of moving your forces from Gibeah to Gibeah to near Michmash, away from Michmash for for too long. Uh, Maybe, maybe this is you. Maybe you said, look, um, I, you know, maybe, maybe I should share the gospel with my neighbors, but it's winter. Nobody gets out in winter. We're all busy. I, I don't know. Do something. Get out your door. Go knock on their door. Say hi. Bring them a meal. Start, start acting. Do some things and, and see what God does with it. Maybe you've said, maybe, this is, maybe I should go into missions but I don't know if I'm called or not. Well, start finding out. Quit your job, see how that goes. <laughs> don't quit your job yet. Maybe you said, I, 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 need, to, I need to share the gospel at work. Stay in your job. <laughs> start doing some stuff. Maybe you're a young guy here. You know, I think maybe God wants me to get married but I don't know, I got video games to play or whatever, you know. Start doing some stuff in that. Maybe you're a person here who said, you know, maybe I should be involved in a church plant, but I don't know for sure. Maybe I should go to to Rome to chill a coffee and be a part of this this church plant, but but I don't know. Hey, start doing some stuff, find out. Put a for sale sign in your yard, see what happens. Why not? 
Go to Realtor.com this afternoon and search and try, what are the houses available like in Chillicothe Rome? Why not do that? Why not start doing some stuff to, get in, to stop being an accident? Maybe I should. Maybe I, Find out. You know that houses in Chillicothe are 18% less <laughs> than houses in, in Washington. I'm just saying. Put up for sale, sign out, see what happens in Chillicothe, and you make some money and give it to the church plant and go on vacation or something. I don't know. To the church replant. But don't tell the church you gave all the money to them and then go on vacation. That does not go well. Right? <laughs> but seriously, do something. Do something by God's grace. And then, and then humbly adjust as needed. Humbly adju- adju- ad- adjust as needed. You may be wrong. <laughs> You may be wrong about some of the specifics. So here are the circumstances. I'm gonna I'm gonna start acting. I'm gonna start doing, and, and then you know what? Uh, this this you know, it, it, God doesn't bless it. It, it doesn't go, and it, it doesn't it doesn't work. Well, okay, James four thirteen. You know, I'm 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 gonna I'm gonna recognize that it, if the Lord wills, the Lord didn't will. That's okay. I'm still gonna I'm still gonna walk in obedience. What's the next thing God's called me to do? Well, I also want to touch on this, and, and we're, not, you know, we're doing an overview of First and Second Samuel, so we're not going to be able to go through all of, all of this to the depth that I would like, but here's the, here's the, here's the caution, right? The, the second thing I want us to talk about here, not only is passivity not obedience, but also presumption is not obedience. Presumption is not obedience. You look at verse 23, that God begins to work this this victory. It says, verse 23, so the Lord, Yahweh, saved Israel that day. And then verse 24, the men of Israel had been hard pressed that day. So Saul had laid an oath on the people saying, cursed be the man who eats food until it is evening and I am avenged on my enemies. Now there is so much wrong in verse 24, right? First of all, God saves, Saul oppresses. Saul, we've talked about before, is an oppressive leader. He's exactly what Samuel had warned against. So God is bringing about salvation, and Saul, in his presumption, is, lays this oath upon the people, and he, he prevents them from eating food because he's, he's trying to manipulate God and the people into accomplishing what he wants to happen. So instead of saying, Let, let's, let's pursue and see what God does, he says, this is what you must do until I have my way. In fact, notice what he says about The enemies, whereas Jonathan had talked about the victory for Israel, 23 talks about saving Israel. What does Saul say? My enemies, my enemies, this is my deal, and you can't eat until I get my way. It doesn't go well, and it just compounds the situation. Things spiral as Saul presumptuously acts. There, there's food as they, as they begin to pursue the Philistines, and the people don't get any. Uh, Jonathan doesn't know about this prohibition that his father has put on the people, and he eats. And the, the people tell him, hey, your dad said not to do that. And Jonathan said, my, my father has troubled the land, he says in verse 29. See how my eyes have become bright because I, I tasted a little of this honey. How much better if, if the people had eaten freely today of the spoil of their enemies that they had found for, for now that it feed among the Philistines, has not been as great. And then, again, things just continue to spiral. They strike down the Philistines from where they were in Michmash and, and continue to pursue them, but they're, they're faint. And then when there is a time to eat, it says they, they pounce on the spoils and they begin to eat in a way that's contrary to the law, not preparing the meat properly. Then, again, things continue to spiral, and they, they are going to continue to pursue the Philistines, verse 36. But the priest says, hey, um, let's draw near to the, God, near to the Lord here and, and ask what to do. And so Saul inquires, and, and it becomes evident that there's, there's something wrong, there's, there's sin among the people. And so he tells uh, the priest to consult the Urim and Thummim, these were two stones that were kept in the breast piece of the, the, the priest's garments, and these two little stones, and you could, it was a, a way that God had ordained before the, the coming of the new covenant to understand his will. 
It was the only uh, ordained means by which they could, could do things like uh, uh, de determining God's will through these, these, these types of means. And Jonathan is eventually revealed to have done something contrary to what Saul had said. And so Saul tells Jonathan, tell me what you've done. And Jonathan told him, I, I tasted a little honey with the tip of my staff that was in my hand. Here I am, I'll die. Now, Saul could have said, no, no, no. There is a, a means by which we can redeem a person in the law. We're going to do that. But that's not how Saul rolls, is it? He's presumptuous, and a presumptuous person is a spiritual danger to those who are around them and a physical danger at times as well. And Saul is a danger to the people. He's a danger to himself, and he's almost so dangerous he costs his son his life. But the people redeem, it, redeem him. Verse 45, the people said to Saul, shall, shall Jonathan die? who has worked this great salvation in Israel far from it as, as the Lord lives. There shall not one hair of his head fall to the ground, for he has worked with God this day. And the people do what Saul should have done and, and ransom Jonathan so that he did not die. And Saul went up from pursuing the Philistines, and the Philistines went to their own place. Saul is a fool who acts presumptuously. His heart is not a heart that looks to God and asks what I should do, but he swings from passivity to presumption. And then verses 47 through 57 kind of serve as a summary of his reign. It tells us about some of the good things and some of the things that are not so good. In fact, verse 48 tells us something positively. It says, he, he did valiantly and struck down the Amalekites and delivered Israel out of the hands of those who plundered them. There are some great things about Saul's reign. Dill Davis is writing about 1 Samuel 14. It says it reminds him of a, of, about a, of a baseball game that was played in Minnesota at the turn of the century. It was uh, between these two Minnesota semi-pro teams, and the, the game was tied, and it went into the 10th inning. At the top of the 10th inning, one of the teams scored a run. And then the, the bottom of the 10th inning, the, the pitcher got up to, to bat, and the, the pitcher on the, the batting team hit a run, got a single, and then a, another player behind him got up to bat, and he hit this, this ball going out in the outfield, far in the outfield, and, and they both begin to run around the bases. So there's the tying run, it's the pitcher, and then the winning run is, is right behind him. And the pitcher passes third base and begins to make his way towards home and collapses. And so the other guy comes up behind him, and he sees this collapsed player, and he's not sure what to do, and so he picks him up, and he, he carries him across the home plate. And it turns out he was dead, but the umpire counted the run. So what do you call that? It, it's a win? But it's also kind of depressing, right? I mean, chapter 14, it, it, it's a win? But this is not the king that's the covenant king. Saul's presumptuous. What does a presumptuous person does? A couple points of application here. A presumptuous person acts in response to circumstances rather than, than trust in God. A person who's presumptuous acts in response to, to, to circumstances instead of trust in God. And if I could commend something to you as, as believers, it would be to, to act in confidence and faith, trusting in a God who loves you. What does Psalm 46 say? Psalm 46 says this in verse 1 and following, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. So, so despite what happens around us, though there is, there's the, the ocean just kind of pouring in around us, whether the, the ground is, is, is shaking and the mountains are trembling, we're not going to worry. The Lord is our, our help, our, our refuge and strength. Verse 4 contrasts with that. There is a river. So not this, not this, temp, this, 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 this ocean that's, that's roaring. There's a, a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations range. 
the, the nations rage, the kingdoms totter. God utters his voice, the earth melts, the Lord of hosts is with us. Now, those are your circumstances. Earthquake, raging waters, but where are you? If you're in Christ, you're in the kingdom that can't be shaken. Even as the, 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 the oceans rage, you're by a river. You're secure in Christ. A presumptuous person doesn't believe that. A presumptuous person is so desperate for a certain outcome, they don't want to know what God's desires are, hear his answer. They're so desperate for an outcome, they'll, they're, they're, they're concerned that if it's not the outcome that God wants. As a result, a person who's presumption, a presumptuous acts on impulse to get, it, to get what they want. They make bad situations worse. They harm others who are close to them. They refuse to back down and repent even when it's obvious that they're wrong. Saul is ready to kill his own son rather than back down and admit that he was wrong. Which that cannot have helped the relationship, right? <laughs> Neither passivity nor presumption fulfill God's purpose for his people. A heart that doesn't love God believes obedience is optional based on circumstances. Now, Saul is not all bad. Psalm, uh, verse 48 He's, he acts valiantly at times. He's not all bad. There, there's a lot of sympathy we have at times for Saul. But, brothers and sisters, God doesn't judge on the basis of not being all bad. God judges based upon his absolute perfection and holiness. And as you look at these verses, I hope all of us would say, you know what? I am a bit of a sinful goof. I, I act with pass. I, I fail to act because I'm passive, and I hope all of us would see glimpses of a heart of, of disobedience, and we'd say, "Well, okay, is is there hope for me?" And and there, of course, there is. Right. The question for us is: Have I trusted in Jesus Christ, the covenant King, the King that that Saul couldn't be, and am I in Him on the basis of the promise of the new covenant? Have I trusted in Jesus Christ and received His forgiveness? And now that I'm I'm in Him, am I becoming more and more like Him? Am I seeing in my, in my life the the fruit of being united with Him, being lived out, as I'm I'm trusting more and I'm obeying more? What did Jonathan say? Jonathan said, God can save by what? Many or by a few. And what did God choose to do? God chose to save by a very few, by one, by the covenant king. 1 Peter 2.5, there is one God, there is one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ. Christ. And so now, what can you and I do? We can look at our hearts. We can say, God, I do not act as I should. I, I fail to act. And when I do act, I often act presumptuously. And, and Father, what I want to do, I want to trust more fully in the covenant king, in Jesus Christ, to receive your forgiveness in your life in him and through the work of your spirit to work with all your energy that you powerfully work within me by your grace for your glory. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful this morning. May, you, may your words convict our hearts and, and drive us more deeply into you. May we see and behold the beauty of your son Jesus, the, 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 the king who reigns over all. And as, as the oceans rage, as, as our hearts tremble, may our, our hearts find our ultimate security and peace in your son Jesus and walk in love and obedience to him. We pray that your spirit would, would soften our hearts this morning. We, we pray that as you bring us into hard and difficult circumstances, your, your spirit would convict and lead and guide and change for your glory. In the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen.